Hey everybody, this is Pastor Josue, and I am here at uh, New Life Assembly of God, and I'm going to uh, go over with you the sermon uh, that we did this past Sunday. Uh, it was so good to see many of you uh, in church, and uh, we're, we apologize for some of the technical difficulties that we had, but uh, we're going to go ahead and, and, and record it and have it ready for you. That way, you, uh, in case you missed it or you missed some of it, you, you, you have all of it, so you'll have the, the rest of the sermon. So we're glad. Um, that you, you, you joined us, and, uh, and we hope that you will join us uh, again uh, this Sunday. We've got multiple services that, you're, that you can come, uh, our French African service on Saturday, our senior service at, 11 at 9 a.m., and then our family service at 11 a.m. So we've got a lot of options for you uh, to, to, to look at and do. <clears throat> go to, uh, with me, if you got your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 6. Verse 1 through 7, we're going to go through, go in there, and, and I'll, let me give you a little bit of background. We are in a series called The Church That Acts, The Church That Acts. So we're talking about the church in Acts and how they face some of the same uh, situations that, that we face. You know, the early church, they face some crazy, crazy uh, uh, things. But even among all those uh, problems that they had, they still grew. They still uh, were used by God and did uh, amazing things to uh, to see the church grow, to see God move. So if you if you go with me in Acts chapter six, uh, verses one through seven, uh, we're going to we're going to read this together and, and, and look at it. All right. Um, the three things we're going to talk about. It's called the it's uh, people, problems and procedures, people, problems and procedures those three things is what occurred in acts chapter six and uh, um the premise of this series of what we're talking about is in romans chapter 8 verse 28 it says that we know and we know that all things work together for good to those who love god to those who are called according to his purpose we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are who are the called according to his purpose. You know, I, I love how Romans 8, 28 begins. It says, and and we know, you know, it's like it's like an inside joke, right? It's an inside joke as Christians. You and I, we, we, we know we know that God's going to work all things together for good. The world out there can be afraid. They can be, you know, the media can be freaking out. The, the, everybody can be full of fear. But, but you and I know, we know, we know that God is going to work all things together for good. It, it, he's going to work it out for your family. He's going to work it out for your business. He's going to work it out for your church, for our church, and for, and for our country. He's going to work it out all things together for good one way or another. God always wins. And so that's what we're looking at. We're looking in the, in the book of Acts how God uh, abused the things that were going on, bad things, that he and he made them uh, good. You know, that's the God that we serve. That's the kind of God that we serve anyways. He's a God that makes bad things good. He makes the terrible things good. He makes them good. I mean, if he can take a world that was empty and void uh, and, and create this beautiful universe that we're in, don't you think that he can take your problem and whatever you're facing, he can turn it together for good? You know, many times when we do things, when we try to do things on our own power, we can make things from bad to worse. But no, that's not what God does. God takes bad things, terrible things, and makes them for good. And that's what he does in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. So Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 7, let's read that together. And it says like this, now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples uh, and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procris, uh, Nicanor, Timon, uh, Par Parmenas, and Nic Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And verse 7 says this, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to 
the faith. You know, any time that you have people, you're, you, can, you can be sure you're going to have problems. Anytime you have people, there's, you're going to have problems. Point number one is this people create problems. People create problems. Let me explain to you here in what, what went on. See, in, in, in the book of Acts, the church began. And as Pentecostals, we know and we celebrated in Acts chapter 2, the day, on the day of Pentecost, the church was birthed. God poured out his spirit on the disciples. There were 120 people in the upper room and, 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 and suddenly came a, a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole room and tongues of fire were on each of them and they all spoke in tongues and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the cool thing in Acts chapter Chapter two, it was the day of Pentecost and there were thousands of millions of people in Jerusalem that were gathered together for uh, this festival. And when they heard them speak in other tongues, they said, wow, this is, you know, what's going on over there? And aren't, aren't these, you know, I think these guys, these guys must be drunk. And Peter rises up when he hears it, he rises up with the 11 and he preaches and he stands up and he says, brethren, you know, my, 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 my fellow is Israelites, my fellow Hebrews. He says, you know, these men are not drunk as you suppose, but they are, you know, it's only nine in the morning. It's only the third hour, you know, the liquor store ain't even open. Right. And, and he, and he says, he says, you know, they're not, they're not full of must. They're not full of, of, of wine, but they are full of the Holy spirit. And he says, this was what was probably prophesied by the by the prophet Joel in, ja, in Joel chapter 2 verse 28 and he begins to preach and and Peter begins to preach and he's preaching this this message this short little message that we read in Acts chapter 2 and at the end of that message guess what 3,000 people get saved and they give their life to Jesus so the church explodes and grows from 120 people in the upper room to 3,120 people at the end of Acts chapter 2. And so they, 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 they grow. And then in Acts chapter 4, uh, 5,000 people get saved because uh, Peter and John, we talked about this the, the last few weeks, the, the weeks before, how Peter and John, when they went to the temple and they saw this, the crippled man at the, at the, at the uh, temple and, and they, the, he asked them for some, for some, uh, uh, some some, some alms for some money. And Peter and, and John said, silver and gold, I have none, but what I do have, I give unto you. Stand up, rise up in the name of Jesus. And this man was healed in Acts chapter uh, three and four. And from that, everybody got to see that, that, that God healed them. And 5,000 people got saved that day. So the church grows from 120 to 3,120 to 8,120. That is one big church. And, 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 and then after that, in Acts chapter 5, verse 14, they quit counting because there were so many people who got saved that they just said there were multitudes of people that got, that got healed. There were multitudes of people that, that gave their lives to Jesus and became Christian. So think about this. The church in, those, in that short amount of time, there was at least over 10,000 people that were part of the church that were growing. They didn't have a temple. They didn't have a building. They didn't have uh, uh, greeters. They didn't have ushers. They didn't have YouTube, Facebook, nice chairs, air conditioning, all that stuff. They didn't even have, they didn't have church bylaws or 501c3, none of that stuff. All right. You know, they, they didn't have any of that stuff. And, but what they did have, come on, they had the Holy Ghost. They had the Holy Spirit. And, and with that, they moved in power. They moved in anointing. They moved in the power of the Holy Spirit. And God was using them and they would do miracle signs and wonders everywhere they go but with that guess what there also came some problems there came some problems when you got that many people I mean you're talking about 12 disciples that are preaching the gospel and they are helping and they are now pastoring over 10,000 people in the in the um, in, in the city of Jerusalem. By the way, they had not left uh, Jerusalem just yet. They were just in Jerusalem. They were still there, uh, in just in, in in one city. And what was going on is that all these Hebrews, all these uh, Israelites, all these Jewish people were getting saved. And among that that group of people, in in, the, in among the people that were getting saved, there were two kinds of people, two groups of people in the church. There were the Hebrews and there were the Hellenists. Now, the Hebrews uh, on one side, what they were, they were Jewish Christians who spoke exclusively in Aramaic. That is the language that they spoke at the time. They, for them, they spoke exclusively in Aramaic. Now, the Hellenists were Jewish Christians whose mother tongue was Greek. They spoke they spoke Greek. And so even among the church, there was a there was a difference between 
there was some prejudice there. There was some, uh, you know, some, some, some division going on in the church, uh, even with miracles and signs and wonders flowing, even with all the great stuff that was going on. There was still some division in the church. And the Hebrews uh, did not like some of the Hellenists because they didn't speak their language. They didn't speak their, 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 the, what, what they spoke. And so uh, there was some stuff. And so what was going on is all these people were getting saved. All these people were coming to Jesus. And in, in Acts chapter 2 and in other verses, it tells us that they would distribute the food. They were distributing clothes. They were distributing help to everybody else. Because as people were getting saved, all right, some of these, all these people had Jewish background. They were getting saved, and, 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 and some of the folks were losing their jobs because when they found out that they were, that they were Christians, the Jewish people would, would fire them from their jobs. They would lose their jobs. Or some, some of their family members would kick them out of their homes and say, no, you can't live here anymore. you got to go somewhere else. So you've got thousands of people. You've got, you got lots of people now that don't have jobs, and they don't have a, a place to live because they are, they are uh, following Jesus. And because of that, they're being persecuted. At that time, listen, there was no equal opportunity, you know, hiring for all that stuff. They didn't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, unemployment. They didn't have any of that stuff. So if you lost your job, if you lost your home, listen, you were, you were probably going to starve to death. And so what was going on is that the church would rise up and step up and help those people. And they would distribute food. They would help them because they were losing, uh, they were losing food. They were, they, they, they needed to eat. They needed to live. And so what was going on? So the, the church got together and they would, they would help them. They would distribute the food. You can look at it in Acts chapter two, verse 42 through 47. You can see that that's what the church did. They shared with one another, all of of their goods, all of their possessions. At the end of Acts, Acts chapter 5, you can see that that even Barnabas later on sells a piece of property just so that everybody can 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 have, uh, uh, so, that, so that that money can go towards the people who needed it. And so um, what was going on is every day they would come in and they would distribute the food and they would give people food and you had two groups of people. You had the, the Hebrews and the Hellenists. And what was going on is that the Hebrews, uh, the, the, the Hebrews would be in the front of the line and they would always go in the front of the line because hey we speak Aramaic we speak of the of, of, of our mother tongue you know we speak a, 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 a pure language we're better than you guys and so they would go in the front of the line and the widows who mainly spoke Greek would be in the back of the line and what was going on is that every day sometimes they would they would pass through and they would run out of food they would run out of stuff and so the the, the women the widows who were the Hellenists they would be in the back of the line they didn't have that stuff they they would run out they would miss out and 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 so the the people from the from that group the Hellenists said hey listen this is not fair we're brothers in Christ just like you guys we should our widows should be taken care of as well and so you've got a problem see here so the People created a problem and, and they needed a solution. Somebody needed to step up. And so what was going on is, and, and, and let me tell you something, as in any organization or when family grows, you will see problems, sometimes good or bad problems to have. Good problems are things like uh, we need more chairs because we, we have so many people coming or we need more parking spaces or we need more classrooms or we need more nursery attendants because we have you know, lots of babies coming to church now. We, we need a larger fellowship hall or we need a bigger sanctuary. Those are good problems to have inside the church. Maybe you run a business and when you run a business, you may need, you're going to say, oh my goodness, my business is growing. I need more employees. I need more equipment. Uh, I, I need, uh, I need, I've got more orders coming. I need more trucks. I need more delivery drivers. I, I, I need, I need, you know, my business, those are good problems to have. Or, you know, maybe when your family grows and you got another baby coming, guess what? You can't, you can't, you know, if you got a baby coming, you can't drive the, the two seat car anymore. You got to get, you know, now you got to get the four seater or maybe you got to get the minivan or the SUV or whatever, you know, but you got to get a bigger vehicle. You got to get a bigger house or, you know, you need a, a new furniture or, or, you know, you've got to put baby gates and all this stuff. You got to do all kinds of stuff that you've got to do. Those are good problems to have. But also, listen, people can create bad problems. They can create bad problems. And, you know, pe problems are going to occur because People are flawed and they, they create problems. They, they, they still have that sinful nature, na nature in them. There are bad problems too. Th this situation that we read in Acts chapter 6 was a bad problem. That was not a good problem to have. That was a bad problem. You know, problems occur because people sin. They, 
They, they fall into sin and they, they do that. You know, pro problems occur. You know, this, this whole, you know, situation that we're doing with the coronavirus was because, you know, be, people, uh, you know, create viruses from eating things that they're not supposed to. I mean, it's just, just, you know, things like that that happen. You know, problems occur because people text or drink and drive. You know, uh, those are problems that are created by people. But here's the thing. Point number two is this. Problems create problems opportunities. Problems create opportunities. In verse three and four, they asked the brothers. So they, they had a, they, the, the, the church got together. All those people got together. They had a special business meeting. And in, and in verse three and in verse four, they all kind of got together. And the, and the disciples said, look, why don't we seek among you guys? Let's seek among you uh, men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over the, this business. And so they appointed them. They found them. They said, let's, let's go find a couple of people to, to serve in this. All right. We, this is now we need to create an opportunity uh, uh, to, to solve this problem. This problem of the distribution of the food created an opportunity for other people to step up and serve. A new ministry was created within the church called deacon. All right. The Greek word for deacon is diakonos, which just, just, just means servant or waiter. Okay? And that's what, they, that's what they did. They would serve tables. They were waiters. They, they would bring the food. They would distribute the food. That's what they did. They were servants. They were waiters. So listen, if you're a deacon out there, you know, I'm glad that we've got great deacons at our church. But if you're a deacon out there, your job is not to boss, or boss the pastor around. Your job is to serve the people, serve the church. All right. That's what, you, what, what deacons actually do. OK, their responsibility was to serve and distribute the food for the people every day and serve the people see too many times we look at problems like a bad thing we look we really uh you know but it really can turn out for good god does this all the time he is the god who turns bad things too good. We look at bad things and we said, no, this is bad. No, but God says, no, this is an opportunity for my power to shine, for my glory to be to be to shine. And, and we need to look at this as a good thing. We need to look at it as an opportunity to see God move in Genesis chapter 50. Verse 20, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, uh, Joseph says this to his brothers. He says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about uh, as it is this day to save many people alive. So what was going on is that in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, after Joseph has been put in jail, after Joseph uh, has been put in, in, a, in a, has been sold into slavery by his brothers, after he's been uh, 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 sold to Potiphar's house, as he gets accused of sin in Potiphar's house, as he goes through and 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 has uh, all these these uh, these accusations on him, and he's put in jail. You know, he gets promoted into second in command to Pharaoh, and by doing that, when a famine comes and a famine occurs for seven years. That created an opportunity for him to save his people during that famine. And, 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 and I love what Joseph said. He said, look, what you meant for evil, God turned it out for good. So church, can we change our perspective about things? We, when you face a problem, don't look at it as a problem, but look at it as an opportunity to see God move. When you get sick, it's an opportunity to see God heal you and show you his power. When you lose your job or don't get the promotion you wanted, let me tell you something, uh, and it's happened to me before, it's an opportunity to get a new one that will pay you more and get you better hours anyways. When you are stuck at home, this is an opportunity to spend time with your family. When you can't go out, this is the time to pray and read your Bible and seek God's face. Come on, we always make excuses that we never have time. Well, baby, you got time now. Make some time to follow Jesus and seek his face. When restaurants are closed, this is the time to eat together as a family and learn and teach your kids how to cook, teach your kids some new things. This is your opportunity. When there isn't children's church, this is the time for you to teach your children about the Lord. When your friends are in trouble this is your time to help and shine your light can i tell you something all of this whenever you go through a problem it's not a setback it is a setup by god to see him move this is an opportunity to see god move 
In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, Jesus says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its, its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16 says this, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Church, this is an opportunity for you to shine. This is an opportunity for you to show God's, God's power and love and glory to other people. Pastor, how can I do that? Well, you might have a neighbor that, 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 that maybe they need help with their lawn being mowed. Go ahead and help them out with that. You may know somebody who lost their job. Why don't you go and bring them some groceries or help them or, or maybe pay a bill for them? Why don't you help somebody, you know, with, you know, maybe there's some, some of our seniors that can't leave the house. You know, why don't you go and, and grab the grocery list for them and, and go shopping for them and help them out, all right? You know, why don't you bring somebody some cookies? Why, here's another thing. If you're stuck at home, you know, if you want the social interaction that you're longing for, why don't you pick up the phone and call somebody, all right? Facebook somebody, you know, do a, do a, a, a face message with somebody and, 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 and see them and check on them, all right? I mean, those are all things that you can do to shine your light so you can call people and check on them and, 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 and make their day, to, day a little bit brighter. This is your your opportunity church this is our opportunity to give people hope everybody else everybody out there in this whole world is freaking out but Christians we cannot be afraid we do not have the spirit of fear but we have the spirit of power love and a sound mind let's share it let's show people that God is with us that God is for us that we're not afraid that 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 we're still doing our precautions things we're taking our precaution but we are not living a fearful life we're we are living a hopeful life because Jesus lives deep inside of us. Come on, this is our opportunity, church, to shine. Let's begin to shine, which brings me to point number three. Opportunities create leaders. Opportunities create leaders. This opportunity gave a chance for others to serve and step up in the ministry. This is where People we had never heard of began to serve in ministry and change history. They changed the history of the church forever. You, the first two uh, deacons that we read there, we're talking about Stephen and Philip. You never hear about Stephen and Philip until Acts chapter 6. But then act, after that, you hear about the story. You read the story about Stephen. Stephen was a great man of God, full of the Holy Spirit, who preached the gospel, who would, when he preached, you know, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they, they didn't want to hear him. They, they hated him so much that he became the first martyr and they stoned him to death. And he died for, for, the, cause to, for the cause of Christ. He was the first martyr recorded in the Bible. And Philip, later on, you know about Philip, who later on gets, uh, gets annoyed and he becomes the evangelist and he preaches to the Ethiopian man uh, who was who was headed back from Jerusalem. He was headed back and, and, and Philip meets him on that chariot and leads him to the Lord and baptizes him in water. He gets swept up by the Holy Spirit and he lands in Samaria and in Samaria he starts preaching the gospel and many people get saved in Samaria. And he is called the evangelist according in the book of Acts. And he starts preaching the gospel in different areas. Come on. This created an opportunity for leaders to stand up and grow. This created an opportunity. So I want to ask you, church, this opportunities that we have, are you going to be a follower or are you going to be a leader? Are you going to be a person who's going to stand up and lead other people? Listen, we need leaders. We need somebody to step up and do what they're supposed to do. In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 14, it says this, the beginning of strife is like releasing water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts stop contention before a quarrel starts so here's what's going on anytime there's a problem anytime there's division anytime there's going on that is like oh turning on the water faucet it's like turning on the water hose and you turn it on and guess what's going to happen when you turn on the water faucet water's just going to go everywhere it's going to flood the house so guess what some people when they see a problem they just look at it and complain about it and say wow look at that problem i wish somebody would do something about it or other people facebook about it and complain about it they will take pictures 
pictures of the problem. They will Facebook live the problem and they would say, look, look at this water that's running. Look at all this problem. Look at what's going on. Guess what? Can you put down your phone? Can you put down your Facebook? Can you stop complaining about it? Be a leader and turn the thing off. So what's going on is we need leaders who are willing to do something about it, turn it off and say, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the person who's going to be bigger and I'm going to be the leader who's going to stop this from getting any further. So we need leaders that, 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 that are uh, people who are going to lead. They're not going to panic. They're going to stay calm. They're not going to be irrational, but they're going to lead their country. They're going to lead the family. They're going to lead the community and they're going to lead the churches full of wisdom and of the Holy Spirit. Come on, church. We need people to step up. And when there's problems, we need somebody to step up and turn this thing off turn the problem off. So we need that. And so what should we do about this? First Timothy chapter two, verse one and two says this. Therefore, I exhort first of all, uh, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings who are who are in authority, that they may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So church, right now, it is your responsibility and my responsibility that we need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for our president. We need to pray for uh, those, those people in charge, our governors, our mayors, all those people, our judges. We need to be praying for them, that they have wisdom and that they will be willing to step up and turn this whole situation around and, and be willing to lead. So our job is to pray for that. So in your job and your family is to lead your family. Make sure you're standing up and leading your family and do what you're supposed to do when it, when it, when it's out. So these opportunities create leaders and brings me to number four. Leaders create growth. Leaders create growth. I want you to see this in verse seven. All right. So after all of this, when they appoint the leaders and he, in, in, in Acts chapter six, verse seven, it says this, then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Look at that. After they appointed all, after they appointed the, 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 the new leaders, after they appointed the new deacons, the word of God spread, and the multitude, and the number of the disciples multitude greatly. It grew even more in Jerusalem, and great many of the priests. They were able to reach some of the priests of the, some of the Jewish priests. They were able to, able to reach them. And even some of them came over to, and became Christians and gave their life to Jesus. Uh, and, and so what was going on is now the, the, the church grew even more and they were able to reach people that they couldn't reach before. So what am I what am I telling you with this is that when you rise up and you have leaders, leaders create growth growth leadership in the church had in the in, in this in this in the scripture had grown from 12 disciples now to seven more deacons now you went from 12 to 19 people in the church leading the church and the result of that was that the church grew when we all begin to step up and use our talents gifts and callings for god there is nothing that a church organization city or country cannot do listen the bible shows us clearly that we all work better together in teams and groups rather than individual in individuals. I mean, you've got Noah. Noah had his sons to help him build the ark. Moses had Joshua and Aaron. And later on, he had the 70 leaders who, who he appointed as leaders over over uh, over Israel. David had his mighty men of valor. Elijah had Elisha. Jesus had his disciples. Paul had Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Titus, Priscilla and Aquila and many others uh, as well. I mean, look, even the devil doesn't work by himself. The devil has demons who help him and to serve. In fact, and in the book of Revelation, the devil's not working by himself. He's going to have the false prophet and the Antichrist. So even he doesn't work by himself. And can I tell you something? God doesn't even work by himself either. He has, it, it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and he also has angels that go out and, 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 and work. And guess what? You and I also serve God, and we get to be part of this. So what am, what am I telling you is that when we have leaders, Leaders, when we have other people standing up, when you have other people that, that are willing to go do what they're supposed to, you're going to see growth in your church, in your organization, in your family and other stuff. So we need this. We need leaders. Proverbs 29 verse 2 says this. 
Proverbs 29 verse 2 says this, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Hallelujah. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. So church, we need some righteous people in authority. We got to pray for them. We need people to rise up. We need good people to rise up. And can I tell you, we need the wicked people to to fail completely, get out completely, because we need the righteous people in authority so that we can move and grow forward. I'm going to close with this. Leadership creates opportunities. So people create problems. Problems create opportunities. Opportunities create leaders. And leaders create growth. I'm going to share with you a story. When I was 15 years old, I was... A, a teenager and my dad was in Paris, Texas, and we were we were in, in, in Northeast Texas and we planted a church together. We planted uh, a church in Paris and, and, and I was a teenager, about 15, 16 years old. My sister was about 13 years old. My brother was about eight years old. And we we, we planted uh, a, a church there. Many times some of our some of our services, it was just just the five of us. There was nobody else. And, and we started and we planted the church and my dad was the, he was the, the pastor. He preached, he taught Sunday school and he also uh, led worship as well. Later on, my mom would help with children's church and, uh, and she would, she would help with children's church and in Sunday school with the kids. My, myself, I would, I would help with worship. My, uh, I would, I would also be in charge of the, of the youth. I would do youth Sunday school. In fact, when I was 15 years old, I was teaching Sunday school. I had the first two people that I led to the Lord was when I was 15 years old as a Sunday school teacher. It was, it was a great experience. Again, can I tell you something that gets addicting. You want to see more people give, give their lives to Jesus. My sister, she was about 12, 13 years old. She was our church secretary. She would pick up the offering and count the offering and, and, and write down people's names and their giving. And she did all that. She, she was in charge of all that stuff. She would be our, our, she did our printing. She would everything, you name it. She was, she was our, she was our church secretary and my, and my brother at eight years old, that's when he began to play drums and he started to learn how to play drums. Later on, he played bass and later on he played guitar and later on, you know, he, he, now he's playing piano. He plays all these kind of instruments. It makes me a little bit jealous as well because he plays so many instruments and he does it really well as well. But what was going on is we were, as a family, we went through a crisis. We went through a crisis because there was nobody. There was no one in our church that was able to help us and step up. And, and, and that produced, for each and every one of us, that produced an opportunity for us to grow in the church and to serve. And now every one of us in the family is serving God one way or another, or another. We're still serving the Lord. We're still preaching. We're still singing. And for me personally, and let me tell you what happened with me, is, 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 is I, I began to lead worship. My dad asked me to lead worship. Now, I, I sang some older songs. We sang hymns. We sang, uh, you know, the choruses. We did all those, those, those songs that we, the, 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 the songs that we had. We, we sang those older songs. We did them. I got to the point, I'm a teenager, and I'm hearing these new songs, you know, these new Christian songs. That I, I'm thinking, man, I, I wish we would play those songs at church. And at that time, I didn't play guitar. I didn't do that. I didn't play guitar. And our, the musicians that we had, they were good musicians, but they just, they, they couldn't play the, the, those, those songs that, 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 we, that we wanted. And, uh, and, and so I, I began to pick up the guitar. I picked up the guitar just to kind of figure out the song and hear the song and, and, and figure out the chords and do that. And so little by little, I picked up the guitar and I got and I would do, you know, one song and two songs. And, you know, it, it got to the point where where I was leading worship with the guitar myself. I was a worship leader with the guitar. And so we were doing that and we'd play and we, you know, and, and, and at, at 18 years old, I was the, I was a worship leader because I had grown. I went from a, it was a crisis that created an opportunity for me to serve in a different capacity. And I was able to lead worship. And now let me tell you something, every church that I've gone to, I've led worship one way or another. I've led worship and by, by leading worship, by being in leadership and serving in church, I le I've led worship. I've taught Sunday school. I've, I've preached, uh, you name it, everywhere we go because of that, it's brought growth to the church. So it, it's not anything to, to show, to, 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 to give myself glory. I want to show you that it gives God glory because when you are in the middle of crisis, when you're in the middle of all these problems, this is an opportunity for you to see God move. This is an opportunity for you to grow and become a better leader. This is what it is, church. This is our time for us to lead our families, 
lead our businesses, lead our churches, lead our country and our communities, and do what God has called us to do. I'm going to pray for you that God will show you and lead you and, and help you to find a way for you to serve him in one way or another. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for speaking to us. God, I pray that each and every one of us here, Lord, will find those problems, Lord, not as negative things, Lord, but we know that you're going to turn those problems into good. You're going to turn all things together for good, and it's going to give you glory, and it's going to give you honor, Father. So here we are, Lord. We surrender to you. Use us for your glory. Use our church. You are, use our businesses. Use our families, God. Use our country to give you glory, Father. We surrender to you. Use our hands. Use our lips. Use our homes, our cars, our, our resources, Father, our jobs. Lord, whatever it is, God, we give you glory and use us, Father, in this time. I thank you, Lord, that many of us are growing. We're growing as leaders. We're becoming better leaders because of this, Father. And I thank you that as we grow as leaders, our churches are going to grow. The kingdom of God is going to grow. And we're going to be able to preach the gospel everywhere, everywhere we go, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for joining me. Have a great day.